Revelation chapter 4, if uh, when we're reading it, some of the words sound familiar, it's because we intentionally chose to have Revelation 4 be um, words that we're saying, because Revelation 4 is, it's a chapter centered around worship, and it's a chapter that, I, that has inspired songs for thousands of years, and so because of that, we wanted to reiterate and emphasize that message through the songs that we sing. But as, as I'm thinking about Revelation 4, something that stands out to me is that the fear of God is something that we need. The fear of God and the vision of God is the transition point in the book of Revelation, from the letters to the churches to the visions of the final times, the cosmic battles, and the closing of the, t of the time on this earth. And Revelation 4 is also where we have an almost perfectly clear picture of the throne room of God, yet at the same time, we don't see God. But there's an emphasis inside of this chapter on who God is. And it's that worship that then builds out. And I want to point out one thing, though. The worship of God in this chapter is both through song and through actions. And if you look at it, it's a playing out of the letters um, in the previous two chapters of worship is a lifestyle that grows out of an awareness of the holiness of God. And because of that, it will be something that lasts for all eternity. So today I, I'm going to talk about the fear of God, I'm going to talk about who God is, and I'm going to talk about worship a little bit. But worship is one of the, the themes that gets reiterated again and again and again and again throughout Revelation. Um, some scholars estimate that there are 19 hymns inside of the book of Revelation. Think about that. It's almost one per chapter. But if you were to think about the book of Revelation as it has been commonly portrayed to you through your lifetime, would worship be the first thing that comes to your mind? Probably not. And some of you might be wondering why I'm going to continually speak as to how we shouldn't think about Revelation being about the Antichrist or the Mark of the Beast it's because the book of Revelation is about Jesus Christ. And if your first thoughts come to anything other than Jesus Christ, that means your heart is drawn to something else. Um, whenever Bennett is afraid, we don't tell her, yes, there's things to be afraid of in this world. There are many dangerous things, you know, and I don't tell her about all the muggings that happened. I don't try to confirm that she has validity in that fear. I say, you are safe here. And I try to draw her eyes to something that's greater. And so the book of Revelation is about Jesus Christ. And this chapter is one that should draw our eyes to Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and God the Father in a triune worship that is the entry point into the largest chunk of the book of Revelation. So let's read all of Revelation chapter 4, and then let's start digging into it unit by unit. After this... I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. And the voice I had first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit, and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had the appearance of jasper and ruby, a rainbow that shone like an emerald and encircled the throne. Surrounding the throne were twenty-four other thrones, and seated on them were twenty-four elders. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings and peals of thunder. In front of the throne, seven lamps were blazing. These are the seven spirits of God. Also in front of the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. In the center around the throne... There were four living creatures, and they were covered with eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion, the second was like an ox, the third was like the face of a man, the fourth was like a flying eagle. 
Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, even under its wings. Day and night, they never stopped saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give, give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives there forever and ever. They lay down their crowns before the throne and say, You are worthy, O Lord, our Lord and God, to receive honor and glory and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their There's a lot going on in this chapter. Now, for some of you who are science fiction movie fans, the imagery here seems like it's normal. But for those of you who don't like to watch science fiction movies, this is a little weird, maybe even a little creepy. The thoughts of eyeballs surrounding every square inch of a creature with six wings in the face of a lion is a little startling to me. I certainly wouldn't want to see that walking down the street. If you want to see that walking down the street, I'm a little concerned as well. You know, if you watch the Marvel movies, this is kind of the creature that comes in at the Battle of Thanos and the other worlds and collisions. And part of that is on purpose, the borrowing of imagery. But I want you to think about this is a discussion of the throne room of God inside of heaven itself. Recently, in the past five to ten years, there was a, a boom in literature about people who went to heaven and came back and told you what it was like. You know, for those of you who don't know, I'm not a fan of those books because those books don't look like this chapter. Those books focus on seeing your loved ones and being in open fields or other things. Some imagery which is borrowed from the end of Revelation, but they don't focus on how when you will be in heaven, do you know it's the one thing that you're going to be concerned about? Worshiping God. Falling down on your face, being completely overwhelmed by the holiness of God. Think about this. You know, and Amazing Grace talks about when we've been there 10,000 years bright shining as the sun. 10,000 years it'll take for you to start to lift your eyes up one inch from the ground and then you'll have to put it right back again. And maybe it'll take 10 million years for, to get your eyes up one foot off the ground to try to gaze at them. And then another 100 million years after that just to be able to look at the holiness and radiance of God. When we think about heaven, sadly... I want to point out that we think about the, the movies like All Dogs Go to Heaven. We have this very bad theology that revolves around does someone get in or not get in? You know, everyone talks about St. Peter. How many of you have heard the jokes, someone goes to, the, goes to heaven and they talk to St. Peter? I want, I want to tell you right now that that comes from a misunderstanding of Catholic theology about entrance into heaven with Peter being given the keys to heaven. So this is the point where I want all, all of us to ask, is my theology about heaven driven by a fear of God, the glory of the gospel, and the explicit words of scripture, or is it driven by Disney? And I ask that because this chapter starts to work out one of the biggest themes of the entire book, which is the question that a lot of people have been asking ever since Job. How can a wonderful God, a glorious God, an honest God, a just God, a loving God, allow all the junk to happen if he is who he is? The big technical word for that question is theodicy, and it's a question that was worked out in Job, and it's a question that's worked out in the book of Revelation. The question of, if God is who he says he is, then why don't we see things happening as we want to? 
And that's why chapter 4 is so important, because before that question starts to be worked out in the book, Revelation chapter 4 reminds you of just the basic principles of who God is. A lot of our questions are questions that need to be asked. God does not shy away from our questions. God's not afraid of any question you have. But oftentimes, we become brazen or we become lazy and we ask questions of God forgetting the first and foremost principle of who he is, which is covered in verse 8. But before we get to verse 8, we need to cover verses 1 through 6. After this I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven, and the voice I had first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. Just a couple time markers that are going on. John is reiterating that, well, he's stating that just like at the start of all these visions that he was getting about the churches to Ephesians, to the, seven, the visions to the seven churches, that same voice is now saying, I'm going to continue to show you who I am and what I'm doing in this world. What it means that I am the one who was and is and is to come. We cannot take too much emphasis off of the statement, and I will show you what must take place after this. People could try to argue a lot of things based off of the, the time statement of after this. What I believe is going on is simply saying, after having shown you these, vi these visions and the letters being sent to the church, now let's talk about the bigger stuff. So verse 2, and at, and at once I was in the Spirit, just like at the start of the book, and like in Ezekiel, in the book of Ezekiel. And I was in the Spirit, and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. Now, I want you to pay really close attention to the words being given and the explanations. Because what a lot of what's going on in the next few verses, what you could try to do, which is wrong, is try to find the symbolism inside of each stone and each word and try to say, how is this symbolic? You know, if I were to try to explain to you every color of the Mona Lisa, you guys would be bored to death and not appreciate the Mona Lisa. So I want right now for you to pay attention to the details, but think of it in a building picture. Laying out where you, you don't get focused up. So, so is Ruby, so Ruby costs this much in the first sentence? No. Listen to this. Because this is a magnificent scene that's supposed to catch our eyes and cause us to be astounded. And the one who sat there had the appearance of jasper and ruby, a rainbow that shone around like an emerald and circled the throne. Surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones, and seated on them were 24 elders. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings and peals of thunder. In front of the throne, seven lamps were blazing, these are the seven spirits of God. Also in front of the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. And the censer around the throne were four living creatures, and they were covered with eyes in front and in back. I'm going to pause there because there's two little unit, there's three units that are going on. One is a description of the throne. The next is a description of the elders around the throne. And then it zooms back in and talks about the living creatures that are in the immediate proximity of the throne of God. <clears throat> now, there is a TV show that I believe just ended that I, I reference because of the imagery of the title, and I hope none of you have ever watched the show. I had the misfortune of having someone turn on the show next to me on a flight whenever I was flying back from India, and I didn't want to watch any of the show but the screens being one inch away from each other, I saw a couple pictures of the show, and we'll tell people don't watch the show. The show Game of Thrones. The title picture for Game of Thrones is this massive, impressive throne that's supposed to shock and awe you. 
Whenever you see a royal figure and they are on a throne, being seated down shows that they are not at war, but are at a, well, they can be at war, but they're at a position of authority. They are able to render out judgment because they're sitting on the throne. They are the one who's in control and in charge. And an interesting thing about thrones, if an actual monarch, an actual ruler, they take someone else's throne very seriously. When the Queen of England visited uh, the set of the Game of Thrones, they asked her if she wanted to take a picture on the throne, and she said, no, royalty will never sit on another royalty's throne, because it is considered usurping the power. So we think about this picture of thrones, and now, what is the greatest throne that you can imagine? You would imagine a throne of maybe all gold, a throne that is massive, or a throne that's very comfortable. Some of you might think no bigger than your lazy boy, and some of you, unfortunately, when you hear throne, you think of the toilet. I want to take you the opposite way. This throne of God is inside of a, obviously, throne room. And there's 24 elders there. Now that 24 is where we do have to ask, is there symbolic imagery? And it's probably the earliest church fathers and historians are fairly certain. That's probably 12 being the 12 tribes of Israel and 12 also being the 12 apostles. 12 and 12, 24. You don't have to dig into too much imagery there, but also 24 is a large number. So it... it could have zero significance, but you see that they're dressed in white. Oh, that comes a little later. They, these, they're there. And that throne itself, though, what's going on? Is this, a, is this a quiet scene? Is this a scene that kind of you sit back and it's like looking at a painting of a landscape? No. Yeah, so surrounding the throne are 24 other thrones, and seated on them were 24 elders. They were dressed in white and crowns of gold on their head. Remember, being dressed in white is something that's going to happen to the one who's victorious, to the churches. And having the crown of gold is something that's promised to the one who's victorious. It's a repeated theme inside of Scripture to have that golden crown. Paul in 2 Timothy 4 verse 8 says he's received the crown because he's been faithful. It says, from the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings and peals of thunder. And in front of the lamp, the throne were seven lampstands blazing. There are the spirits of God. And in front of that was a sea of glass clear as crystal. This is a scene that you cannot actually envision. It is beyond human comprehension. We can try to draw, we can try to imagine, but it's so grand. I mean, how do you imagine a throne that is literally sending out thunder from it, surrounded by a rainbow that is glowing, and the person on that throne, what's the description of the person sitting on the throne? Is he about six foot two, 185 pounds, 4% muscle, you know, 4% fat, not muscle. 4% muscle would be terrible. <laughs> Very terrible. You know, like, what color, what color are his eyes? You know, is he, is he older? Is he younger? Does it say much about him? No. This goes back to a reality that Scripture, specifically mentioned in, in Exodus, no one can see the face of God and live. Not even John can see the face of God and live. So he's being given a vision of the throne room of God. And God is so amazing that even in a vision, John the Beloved is unable to see God because that's how amazing God is. This side of the new heavens and the new earth, we are incapable of absorbing the greatness of God. And why do I mention this, though? Why is this so important? Well, this vision of the throne room of God is building and building and building, and it's supposed to cause listeners to be a little bit afraid. 
The imagery of the thunder and the lightning. This was, this is a repeated theme for whenever Moses was on Mount Sinai, when the tabernacle was completed, whenever the first temple was completed. This is the sound and picture that is echoed whenever Jesus is crucified and everything goes dark and the temple veil is torn. This is also what's pictured a little bit whenever the Pentecost happens. This is a salvation theme event that's going on that is showing, though, the incredible, awe-inspiring might and glory of God. And we haven't even talked about the immediate proximity of the throne, because when I start reading in verse 7, a lot of you are going to have a hard time imagining it because it's so fantastic and fantastical. But you read it closer and closer, especially reading again verses 1 through 6. This is actually describing the throne of God. The four living creatures are that which God sits upon. So take that a step further in thinking about the magnificence of God. Now, for those of you who, again, are science fiction fans, anyone know who the Kraken is? Come on, you guys had to have seen Pirates of the Caribbean. It's a giant squid. Now, if you were to see a picture of, that I drew of the Kraken, which I haven't drawn this picture in case you're about to worry, this giant Kraken, and I'm sitting on top of it, reining it in, what kind of picture of that power of me would that be? That I would be mighty enough to contain that creature. And this God is sitting upon four living creatures. The first living creature was like a lion. The second was like an ox. The third had the face like a man. And the fourth, like a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, even under their wings. Now, real quick, the imagery, a lot of people wonder, why is there an ox? Why is there a lion? Why is there a man? Why is there an eagle? Are these picturing kingdoms? Let's go back in history and see what kingdoms represented by an ox. What one? Time. Let's just go back to Genesis. The ox is the picture of the greatest land creature of those that eat the grass. That's why Randy loves his cow. Then, what's the big deal about a lion? They're the king over all the jungle. What's the big deal of an eagle? Who's the king of the air? And then, in Genesis, who is the peak culmination of creation? Who is? Man is. So this throne is literally all the greatest of the created. God is on top of them. Seated in his grandeur. Now, what are all the greatest of the greatest saying? Day and night, they never stop saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. You know, for me to get one of my high school runners to say I'm a good runner, that doesn't mean much. If I were to get an Olympic gold medalist to come and say, you're the greatest, Ben, that might mean something. If I were to get the four greatest athletes from the four greatest sports to come and say, Ben, you're not just the greatest runner, you're the greatest period athlete without argument, that would lend some credibility. What are the greatest of all creation declaring of God from all time, from day and night, holy, holy, holy. It starts off with that, that, that the tri it's called the trihagios, because people like to put big words together. That just means three holy. Isaiah 6. What do the angels say? Holy, holy, holy. 
Why is it holy, 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 not holy or holy, holy? Well, this is where a little bit of cultural context makes sense, but at the same time, if I'm wanting you to stop doing something, I don't go, stop. And you keep doing it, I might go, stop, stop. Now, if I want Bennett to really stop doing something, I might go, stop, stop, stop! We know that the reiteration, the repetition, the continued statement of a word emphasizes it. But what is holy? I've explained holiness before, but I, this is the core definition of who God is. This is the umbrella upon which all of his characteristics fall. And therefore, how we view him and worship him and follow him have to exist. What is holiness? Holiness is a complete separation from something. It is that distinct line between creator and creation. It means that it transcends and is not subject to the other. The holiness of God means that there's nothing like that. You, you can't compare God to anything else. Incomparable. But not only that, because he's transcendent, that means he's not broken by the things in the creation. Being holy has an ethical standpoint, it has a moral standpoint, and it has a, the big word, ontological standpoint, meaning a, a being reality. He is greater than, meaning his being is completely different. Moral, meaning that he is not stained by sin. He cannot be stained by sin. He can do nothing wrong, which bleeds into the ethical part. As holy, that means every action that God does is declared holy, because he is the one who does it. Now here's something else that I want to, I want to just give this a quick note, because this is built upon in chapter 5, but it's part of the essence. God as holy, was he Bound by any rule to redeem humanity? No. Was he bound to reconcile a broken relationship with his creation? No. So part of God's holiness that is so astounding is the fact that he himself did reconcile, and not only that, he himself initiated the reconciliation between himself and creation. But what has to be stated there is he is the only one who is able, capable, and worthy of that task. Because who is able to reconcile if they themselves are need, in need of reconciliation. So holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. He's absolutely holy and he's absolutely powerful. The Lord God Almighty. This doesn't say the Lord God who's powerful. It says Almighty. There being all meaning all. This isn't where we argue about is God able to make a, you know, is God so powerful that he's able to make a rock that he's unable of lifting or is how many heads how many angels can dance on the head of a pen people ask really stupid theology questions to try to add out a, add out a point this is saying god you're absolutely separate from your separate from your creation but yet you are absolutely capable of making any created thing you are almighty but not only this but you are absolutely sovereign so one of the issues that we talk about is, like, if you were to say, who is the greatest emperor in Chinese history? You can argue, but what would it all come down to? It's a comparison across ages, and each of those emperors had a high point and a low point. They had a peak time. Maybe the greatest ruler of a country ruled for 40 years. Think about David and Solomon. They ruled for a long time, but what is, this, what is 40 years in the scope of the thousands of years? Nothing. So, God, you're holy, 
But are you holy for all time? You're mighty, but are you always mighty? Yes, who was and is and is to come. And this worship is what's being stated. And now worship is an action. They are stating this day and night. And we'll see later that there's an aspect of physical bowing in the worship. But I want us to think about something else. Worship, worship is a declaration of truth. And the more you understand someone or something, the more truth you can declare about it. If God is almighty, all holy, all sovereign, eternal, that means he is always able to be learned of. We are always able to glean a greater understanding of him and therefore pro proclaim truth. And this is one of the biggest dangers is that we, as people, start falling down into a proclamation of untruth. We start saying things that aren't true about God, or we do it by stating things that, that doubt where He is in the moment, or we just start saying things that are untrue. Think about it. Is your life a demonstration of the worship of God? Are you one who declares truth? Or are you one who declares untruth? And remember, truth is not controlled by what we like. It's not controlled by what we want. It's not controlled by what a person tells us. Truth is defined by God and His declaration. It's not just the living creatures, though, that are saying this, because sometimes we might think, well, I'm stuck in the here and the now. Whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever, notice that the worship song is just repeated in sentence, regular form. This chapter is trying to repeat stuff to us. That we can have this bigger picture of God, more afraid of Him, and more worshiping Him, and more in love with Him. It says, the 24 elders fall down before Him who sits on the throne and worship Him who lives there forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne. Before they, I say what they say. Inside of our walk with God, God uses many means by which to motivate us to be faithful. God promises Rewards for faithfulness. The greatest reward that we could have would be a crown. The crown that we get, which is a reward by God, and that we could look at the previous letters being maybe even a picture of our ability to rule in God's kingdom, what do we do with it? Do we put it in a nice little box and display case? Because maybe it's too big to really wear on your head. You know, not comfortable, don't want to get hat hair. Who wants to have crown hair? Not me. We take our throne, our crown, and we throw it before the Lord. Now, now what is this? What is that showing though? This is again one of those really interesting notes that inside of history, whenever one kingdom was ruled by another, the kings of the vassal kingdom, the kingdom that was underneath, it was common that they would come and they would give their crown to the king saying, you are the true king. A handing over of their crown was a demonstration of them putting themselves subordinate to that greater king. So think about this. Whatever reward you could have, the highest level of eternal reward, which God uses rewards as motivation for his followers, the only good that it has is to give back to God. Because there's no greater reward that we could have than to know God eternally. Think about that. Think about what motivates you. This, this is where... As Christians, our motivation should come from an understanding of God's worth. You know, we talk about in coaching terms, 
The greatest coaches may, you know, will motivate their athletes to run through a brick wall. But then comes the question, should you have to have the greatest coach in the world to put forth your full effort? No. But God himself is so worthy that everything we do should be done for his glory and for his honor. Which, part of that goes into living a life of worship. Also goes into a life where we have the rhythms and the practices. God lays it out. Six days you work, one day you rest. And all these other greater parts. Enjoy your family, respect others, think about things that are good. Worship is a whole lifestyle. But also look at this, where it says, the 24 elders bow down, they fall down, and lay their crowns. This is where worship is not just singing on Sundays. We can often fall into a very, very, very dangerous, and I would say sinister trap, whenever we define worship as singing. Now, this is one of the favorite things at Moody with the pastoral majors and the worship majors. Because we're like, what are you doing? This isn't, this isn't a worship chapel. This is a singing chapel. Worship is a whole life that is, you could argue, best demonstrated through singing because there's something transcendent about singing. There's something that we can't explain about singing that books and books and books could be written and it's just mysterious. But notice that it doesn't say that these elders just worship. They physically fell, showing that their posture was positioned towards God in a humble and weak way. And well, what is it about bowing, though, that, that makes a big deal? Or falling down? Well, if, if I were to be, again, this is like, imagine that we're in a time where people are Warring not with guns and nuclear missiles and drones and, and pilots or even ships, but a time where people warred with bow and arrows and swords primarily. If I come before you as a general that or a king that is submitting to and I've thrown in the towel, I go before you saying, hey, my kingdom is yours, we will serve you, and I bow down before that king, can you really defend yourself if you're looking down at the ground against a sword? Can, can you, if that king wanted to chop my head off, which would be a just action by a king to a other king that was a threat, bowing down, you're completely leaving yourself open. It shows vulnerability and trust. Falling down is a physical action that we do before the Lord. This is also why I've mentioned it at times, and I'm not saying we have to do things while we sing. I understand that clapping and singing, I can't do it. Think about why is it that whenever some people sing, they have to sway? Why is it that when some people sing, they lift their hands? Why is it that I have seen it when some people sing, they bow down on the ground? Why is it? Because it shows that worship is more than words. And the laying down of your crown means giving back all that you have. Literally giving back all that you have. Submitting it to the Lord symbolically. But they say, you are worthy, our Lord and God. Worthy of what? To receive glory and honor, and power. Why is God worthy of these things? What was mentioned by the created things, the, the peak of creation in verse 8, isn't stated here in verse 11. You are worthy to receive glory, honor, and power, for you created all things. Now this is inherently tied into the term holiness. But it goes, so God created... But it was by your will they were created. And I, I want to I emphasize that for a little bit. We ourselves don't really dig too much into this. We understand God is creator. I'm not trying to argue against you for some myth of where, like, look up how, how did the Egyptians believe the world was made? How did the Greeks believe the world was made? How did the Norse believe? 
God created by his will. Meaning God didn't need anything else to make. It's not that God had to have this giant putty ball that he molded into the world. But he created through his will. Showing that he was, goes back to the Almighty. He's so mighty that he doesn't need anything in order to accomplish his will. Just his will is needed. And then it says, And they have, by your will, they were created and have their being. The reason why you and I exist is because God is desiring for us to exist. Think about that. We're not just created, but our very being is centered inside of the will and essence of who God is. We need to fear God. I don't like that oftentimes when people talk about the fear of God, they try to water it down. No, fearing God doesn't mean what it sounds like. It just means really respecting Him. Well, exactly, Gracie. There is nothing on the same level as God. Nothing. We need to be terrified of God. Because it is until, if we think we are worthy of walking before God by anything other than the blood of Jesus, that is a blasphemy against God's holiness. He is the one who causes the relationship with us. And this is why what builds out of it we are holy, we are called to be holy because he's holy. And his holiness and his might and his glory and his grandeur should cause us to tremble. In the book of James, whenever James is talking about faith without works and works and faith, that battle in James chapter 2, he says, even the demons believe that God is one. And he doesn't just sit there and say, yeah, you know, they believe he's one. The understanding that demons have of a basic principle that God is one, they tremble out of fear of that. If we, and it's that ultimate fear of God that leads into chapter 5, where this worthiness of the Lamb who was slain that makes our reconciled relationship with God so awesome. If Walter Payton was still alive, would you think it's, you know, and you were to see him walking down the, the street, would you go, oh, there's Walter. Hi, Walter. And you just act like he's a nobody. If Walter Payton walked up, you, you know, if you were like a good person, you wouldn't. You wouldn't try to disrupt him because that would be rude. But if Walter Payton walked up to you, held out his hand, that was probably the size of that you know, piano, tried to shake your hand and said, Hi, my name's Walter. What's yours? That would just level you because you're like this man who's the greatest running back, arguably, of all time, wants to know my name. And it is because of how great Walter Payton was that would make that event so big and so significant. God desires to have a relationship with you. This one who causes you to be afraid and fall down. Remember the 24 people? They're probably representative of the 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 apostles, meaning the people who are worthy, clothed with light. They're, they are able to have a relationship with God. They're flat, they're flat on their face. This God, who makes anyone who sees him declare, holy, 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 I am unworthy, and fall on their face, he desires to be in a right relationship with you. This is why the fear of God is so important, because it's the groundwork upon the rest of the book is. We need to know who God is, so we can actually fear him for who he is and worship him for who he is. Because that causes us to navigate the mythical, wonderful, image-rich story that's going to go on in the rest of this book. But it then drives us in our current now and today to live more mindful. 
knowing that God is almighty, he always is, he sees what we're doing, that should cause us to be holy in what we say and what we do. Think about this. Why is it that oftentimes when people find out that I'm a pastor, they stop swearing? I actually had it happen. I was talking to someone outside, and this lady's grandkids pulled up, and they were just F-bombing each other like it was a definite article inside of their sentence. They were just using it. And then, you know, oh, hey, this is, this is Ben. He's the pastor of Grace Bible Church. Oh, sorry, pastor. Sorry, sorry. I'm like, I don't care. God cares how you speak, though. I'm, I, I think you should never clean up your language for me. I want you to clean up your language for my daughters if they're around. But you should be cleaning up your language because God is around. You know, think about this. If someone were to look at the browsing history on your phone, would you be embarrassed? God already saw it. You know, well, some of you, you can't have a browsing history on your phone. I understand that. But If God were to see how you talk to your husband or to your wife, he already has. And a lot of us were too embarrassed about something that we would, oh, we don't want everyone to know my issues here or my problems there. God already does. And that should cause us to then live more holy. And that's the message of the book of Revelation. Um, it's not too complicated beyond that, but we'll continue to work through it. Pray with me, and we'll close in a final song.